Welcome everyone. On behalf of the Australian Research Centre for Human Evolution at Griffith University, I welcome you all to the fourth annual Raymond Art Lecture. I'm Professor Daryl Jones, Acting Director of Arche. Before we proceed, I wish to pay my sincere respects to the traditional custodians of the land many of us are currently living and working on. For those of us in Brisbane, this is the Jagera and Turrbal people. I acknowledge their stewardship and continuing presence on this land. Sovereignty was never ceded and the struggle for existence and, and justice continues. Raymond Dart was born in Brisbane, 1883, 1893, and he attended Ipswich Grammar School between 18, uh, 1906 and 1909. He later studied at the very newly established Queensland University and then took a degree in medicine at the University of Sydney. During the First World War, he worked as a, a captain and a medic in the Australian Army in both England and France. After the war, he took up the position of Professor of Anatomy at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa in 1922. He was later to make one of the most remarkable findings in human, human paleo, paleoanthropology. A, a strange specimen he unearthed in 1924 in a lime quarry in Tiang, South Africa, which became known as Tiang Child. Was the, was the type specimen of Orthopithecus africanus. Following his Nature paper in, 2000, in 1925, its significance was rejected by the scientific establishment for over a decade. Later discoveries eventually confirmed the fossil's place and Dart's assertions within the human lineage and raised Dart's profile as one of the most significant paleoanthropologists in the history of the discipline. Griffith University maintained strong links with the University of Witwatersrand, and indeed Ipswich Grammar. The Brisbane connection with DART is an, an, an important element of the Australian Research Centre for Human Evolution. Researchers in the centre investigate broad issues surrounding human evolution from with fieldwork in Australia, New Guinea, throughout Southeast Asia, and of course, Southern Africa. Arche con continues attempts to test evolutionary ideas using multidisciplinary approaches and has a strong foundation in the ecological and evolutionary theory. Although Arche's history is not long, the annual Raymond Dart lectures have become an important tradition, allowing internationally prominent researchers to share their views within a very broad multidisciplinary arena of human evolution. Today, we are proud to host the fourth Raymond Dart lecture by Professor Rebecca Ackerman, who I will now introduce. Professor Rebecca, universally known as Becky Ackerman, was founding director and is currently the deputy director of the Human Evolution Research Institute at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. She is also deputy dean of transformation in the Faculty of Science at, at Cape Town and the chair of the Committee on Diversity International for the American Association for Physical Anthropologists. Becky was involved in a prominent sexual harassment case in paleoanthropology that received considerable coverage in the science journal, in journal science, and has been engaged in the advancement of women in the field more generally, including as a recipient of a number of major international grants advancing women in the field. Last year, she was named as one of the women changing South Africa by the, the, guard, the Mail and Guardian. In her research, she has worked across the fossil record of human evolution and was a member of the team involved in the initial descriptions of homo, homo Nalida in South Africa. She has also undertaken paradigm shifting re research on the role of hybridization, playing and shaping human evolution. Recent publications have dealt with racism and colonialism in biological anthropology, including authorship of the new statement of race and racism for the preeminent journal in the biological anthropology, the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. She, she is therefore ideally placed to present the 20 20 Raymond Dart Lecture, S Scientific Sovereignty in Paleoanthropology, How Contemporary Events Are Exposing Systemic Inequities. Over to you, Becky. Great. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start by thanking Daryl for that introduction, and I particularly appreciate your acknowledgement of the Indigenous people and their lands in Australia. 
Um, I also want to thank you and the Australian Research Centre for Human Evolution at Griffith University for inviting me to, go, to come and give this talk. You know, it's really an honour to be here. Um, many thanks also to the broader community in Australia and beyond for attending today. And I'm really sorry that I can't be there in Brisbane in person. You know, it's I've never been to Australia and I would have really enjoyed that. But this format does have a benefit and it benefits us by allowing a much wider and potentially more diverse international audience um, to attend, for which I'm, I'm quite grateful. I also want to um, start by thanking all of the people in my life who have contributed to my thinking around the topic that I'm going to discuss today. And I especially want to single out Sheila Athrea and Krista Kuljian, um, as well as my colleagues at the Human Evolution Research Institute, or what we call HARI, and all of my current, current and former postgraduate students and mentees who have really helped me grow and learn in important ways. Um, I really miss seeing them all in person, I must say. It's a strange uh, world that we're in. So as Daryl said, I'm Rebecca Ackerman, or Becky Ackerman. I'm a biological anthropologist, and more specifically, a paleoanthropologist. And that means that my interests lie in the biology and in the associated behavioral changes that have occurred in our fossil ancestors over the course of human evolution. Um, as Daryl mentioned, I'm located at UCT, uh, which is what we call the University of Cape Town, and that's shown here in this picture. I'm um, not located there right now. Right now I'm located in my living room. I miss UCT as well. Um, I've been at UCT for the past 20 years and worked my way up from a lecturer to full professor. And I'm currently the deputy director of HARI, which I founded, and I'm the deputy dean for transformation in the Faculty of Science. And what that means is that I'm responsible for initiatives around equity, diversity, and inclusion within um, my faculty, the Faculty of Science. And I wanted to mention um, that transformation is taken very seriously at UCT. It's backed by our all women executive academic leadership team of the vice chancellor, Professor Mamacheti Pekeng, and the three deputy vice chancellors. Only 39 of the top 200 universities in the world, or 20%, are run by women, according to the recent Times Higher Education World University Rankings, and we're one of them. Um, this photo here is from my inaugural lecture with the three deputy vice chancellors pictured on my left or the right side of the screen and the vice chancellor on my right, followed by a close colleague of mine and the current dean of the Faculty of Science, Professor Mono Romatsundela. So my research focuses on studying the interaction between variation and evolution. So how evolution produces variation, which is of course necessary in turn for evolution to occur. Um, a way to think about this is if we were all identical, there could be no change. We need variation in order to evolve. And I study variation in a lot of living models, in living humans, apes, monkeys, mice, <laughs> dogs, and others as well, in order to understand why our ancestors evolved to look the way they do, you know, why we have so much diversity in the fossil record of human evolution, as is pictured here, and especially how the evolutionary forces of natural selection, which you may be familiar with, um, gene flow through hybridization, and genetic drift, which is essentially random chance, how those forces have acted together to create the diversity of human ancestors that we see in the past and like you see on your screen. What my research has been showing in a nutshell is that we are really complex and our history hasn't followed the traditional storyline of one group of early humans developing superior abilities and outcompeting other groups, um, groups like the Neanderthals, and then conquering the world. And instead, we evolved through a complex interplay of migration, interaction, and genetic and cultural exchange that, along with things like adaptation to new environments, shaped who we are today as a species. So our evolution was not linear. It wasn't even a tree, um, but rather something more like a braided stream. But I'm not going to talk primarily about that aspect of my research today, although it is relevant to my topic 
And I will come come back to this complex narrative of human origins in particular later on, as, as you're going to see. But right now in this uncertain, charged, changing world that we're in, I want to talk to you about scientific sovereignty and paleoanthropology. And by that, I mean, who holds the status, the power, or the authority in science, and therefore who in essence owns the science, um, controlling both how science is done and what stories are told. And I'm going to demonstrate that the persistence of racist, colonial, and patriarchal practices into the present is perpetuating the problematic, the problematic status quo. And it's leaving authority largely in the hands of, well, the same people who have always had authority. And then I will tell you why, as academic and public consumers of human evolution narratives, you should care. So I want to start today by telling three short South African stories. Story number one, measuring and displaying black bodies. And I need to give a content warning here. Um, the upcoming images contain people and bones uh, in this section and also in the next. And while they are necessary to demonstrate um, some of the points I'm trying to demonstrate, you might find some of them disturbing. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with the story of Sarah Bartman. Sarah Bartman was a South African Khoi Khoi woman who was taken to Europe in the early 1800s and put on display in London and in Paris as an example of a so-called living savage where for a fee, people were able to see and to touch her. The practice of putting people of color on display in so-called human zoos was common during this time of colonial science. Science was deeply embedded in theories that postulated that Africans, Asians, and Native Americans in particular were biologically inferior to white people, and therefore that they were candidates for study study that aimed to explain why they were inferior. There was also an obsession with hypersexualized stereotypes about African women in particular. And Sarah Bartman was objectified and displayed largely because of her large buttocks, which we now um, refer to as stenopegia. She was dubbed the so-called Hottentot Venus, which was a reference to her race Hottentot being a, a term for Khoi Khoi people, which is now seen as derogatory. And it was a reference to her sexuality. So in other words, Venus, right? The Roman god of love and beauty. So Sarah Bartman was a victim of colonial science in the service of both racism and sexism. She descended into poverty and died in 1815 at the age of 26. After her early death, George Cuvier, a professor of comparative anatomy who knew and had previously examined her when she was alive, dissected her body and interpreted her body as ape-like and a so-called missing link between animals and humans. He created a plaster cast of her body, which went on display along with her skeleton in French museums until the 1970s, as you can see here. These ideas and practices continued to flourish through the 1800s. And even in the early 1900s, scientists, including those with paleoanthropological interests, were actively pursuing research agendas to support notions that some groups of living humans were more primitive than others. And indeed, the, the search for human origins was inseparable at that time from the search for primitive people. Living indigenous non-European people were actively being studied because they were believed to be less evolved, even less human, and thus to provide insight into our early human ancestors. In 1922, the Australian-born Raymond Dart came to South Africa to take up the post of chair of anatomy at the University of the Witwatersrand, which we call WITS. Dart is best known 
as for arguing that the town child discovered in 1924 at town, 130 kilometers north of Kimberley in South Africa, was an early human ancestor, which he named Australopithecus africanus. But along with Robert Broom, a Scottish medical doctor who had settled in South Africa and also had a keen interest in human origins, Dart's research interests grew to include living people. Broom himself was directly engaged in body collection, often under dubious circumstances. Around the same time as the town discovery, Dart declared that living indigenous South Africans represented the ancestral stock from which humans were derived. And later he participated in expeditions such as the University of the Witwatersrand Kalahari Bushman expedition of 1936, where he and colleagues generated morphological data, photographs, and face masks from local people. These masks continued to be made into the 1980s by Dart's mentee, South African born Philip Tobias. And today they form the Raymond A. Dart collection of African life and death masks, which numbers over a thousand and is still housed at Vitz. Dart and his contemporaries also paid special attention to secondary sexual characteristics of black women in particular. And researchers, including Tobias, made direct measurements of the labia of living black women, furthering the same practices of dehumanization and otherizing that doomed Sarah Bartman. Philip Tobias took over from Dart as chair of the Witz Anatomy Department in 1959. And ultimately he transitioned away from participating in racist practices. Um, and he became a voice for the oppressed and an activist for the eradication of apartheid. And he helped to facilitate um, the lengthy and the contested process of repatriation of Sarah Bartman's remains, which occurred at last in 2002. She was buried in the province of her birth on South Africa's National Women's Day. In the midst of the roads must fall and fees must fall movements of 2015 and 2016 in South Africa, movements that were centered around the call for decolonization of institutions of higher learning, a publicly displayed culture, sculpture of an unclothed Sarah Bartman at my university, University of Cape Town or UCT, became the focus of intense scrutiny, a representation of not only the stories and experiences of women, particularly black South African women, but also a symbol of the legitimization of racism using science. This statue was clothed by protesters and eventually moved to a new location and recontextualized. On December 8th, 2018, UCT made the historic decision to rename our major hall at the center of campus, um, the hall where graduations and other special activities are held, to Sarah Bartman Hall. Story number two, how I came to South Africa. This is some old pictures here. <laughs> I was born in the United States uh, to a middle class family and I spent a lot of time outdoors when I was young, traveling with my family to um, many, maybe most of the national parks in the US and in Canada. And yes, uh, even learning how to flint knapstone tools, as you can see here on the picture on the right. I grew up and I went to public school in a heavily white, relatively safe and privileged suburb of Chicago. And I went to university at the University of Chicago. After finishing my master's degree at the University of Arizona, specializing in forensic anthropology, I moved to Wash U, Washington University in St. Louis, also called Wash U, where I first had the opportunity to pursue my interest in actively studying the fossil remains of our ancestors. The Department of Anthropology at WashU has and had a long-standing connection to South Africa, including professors and other students before me who conducted research there. 
And these networks opened up opportunities for me and helped to facilitate my ability to work in South Africa. In 1995, one year after the end of apartheid, when I was 26 years of age, I boarded a plane to Johannesburg. It was my first trip ever outside of the US. In Joburg, I stayed with, and I largely hung out with, other Americans from my university who were also there as researchers or lecturers in the Witts Anatomy Department, um, now called the School of Anatomical Sciences. My goal for that two months in South Africa was to increase the possibility of getting funding for my PhD project by gathering pilot data from modern human skeletons um, in order to understand variation in our species as a benchmark for interpreting variation in fossil human ancestors. In addition to the African life and death masks, the Raymond A. Dark collection at Witts also includes modern human skeletons and archaeological human remains. And as I said, I was primarily there to study the modern human skeletons as well as fossil hominins, so fossil human ancestors. This modern human skeleton collection is the largest human skeleton collection within Africa and consists of around 3,000 documented skeletons derived from cadavers. Most of the skeletons are those of Black South Africans. Prior to 1958, the collection was derived entirely from unclaimed bodies from South African hospitals. After that, a body donation program was established, which also contributed to the collection. DART began this collection based in part on ideas developed during a visit to my PhD institution, WashU in St. Louis, as a Rockefeller Fellow in 1921, where he worked with Robert Terry, who himself started a well-known skeletal collection. This was part of a larger, larger global movement within anthropology and related disciplines around this time to build up skeletal collections, primarily of non-white people, the dispossessed, and the underprivileged. Collection practices internationally included stealing bodies from burials, battlefields, and from hospitals. Back in the mid 90s, the restrictions around researchers directly accessing skeletal, skeletal remains were less strict than they are now. And this is one of my pictures of the collection from that time. Rather than requesting specific individuals and having a, a curator bring them to me, as is the process now, I was given essentially given a key to the collection room and allowed to get my own material. After a few weeks, I had amassed a collection of human skulls as comparative material that spoke to my interests in morphological variation and had some of them on a shelf in front of me while I worked. One day, Philip Tobias walked in and he introduced himself and he asked why I'd put those particular skulls on the shelves in front of me. This ultimately led to a, a, a remarkable four hour conversation between us about a whole range of things, including the intersection of science and art. He gave me a tour of the department, the African life and death masks hung on the wall. That was also the year South Africa famously won, won the Rugby World Cup the first time they ever got to the final, and only three years after they were allowed back into the sport post-apartheid. Experiencing the joy and the unification of that moment was really remarkable. And it seemed at the time, like Archbishop Desmond Tutu's description of South Africa as a, a rainbow nation, which emphasized unity, common ground, and sameness, rather than focusing on differences, might actually become true. It's also worth mentioning that my visit to South Africa was not all fun. Um, for the third time in my young career, but not the last, I was sexually harassed by an academic who had power over my future, an early lesson on problems that exist in the discipline. So on that same visit to South Africa, my American colleagues and I conducted field work at Buffalo Cave in the Makapanskat Valley. And while there a field school of 
largely Americans, led by another person with a WashU connection, joined us. I was back in South Africa again the following year for a few months, as well as Kenya, doing some final data collection for my PhD after securing substantial funding on the basis of that pilot project. And in 1999, a job advert came across my desk for a biological anthropology lecture position in the Department of Archaeology at UCT. It was what I now understand to be a development post, meaning that it prioritized the hiring of Black South African women. Nonetheless, I applied, and since there were no qualified South Africans at the time, I got the job. In 2000, I immigrated there, here to South Africa, with my husband and our three old dogs, and have been here ever since. Story number three, unsung heroes. Two decades after my first visit to South Africa, two decades, one of my PhD students, a black South African woman, was part of a research team that made her very uncomfortable, not merely for its lack of diversity and primarily foreign team, but also because of subtle comments and practices that made her feel alienated as an African. And indeed, over the years, many of my South African students have had to deal with racism, sexism, and harassment, things that I have learned are unfortunately not uncommon in our discipline. Additionally, they have had to deal with other alienating events with colonial global north overtones, including remarks questioning their intellectual abilities, their rights with regards to ownership of African heritage, and their worthiness to even conduct, conduct their own research in their own country. The latter most prominently evidenced by multiple instances of outright poaching of their research projects by foreigners. More generally, it is well known in paleoanthropology and related disciplines like archaeology that there are still foreign researchers who claim a certain level of ownership over and rights to study and to exclude others from studying um, African material that they have excavated. The alienation and marginalization of Black paleoanthropology participants in South Africa has a long history, tracing well back into Broome and Dart's time, when field workers were typically Black and professors white, and in the case of Broome and Dart, foreign. These field workers often went unnamed and uncredited for their roles in generating South African heritage. In an apartheid context, it seems quite likely that those in positions of power did not consider them capable of contributing in a meaningful way to the production of scientific knowledge. Today, black field workers in Africa are increasingly be, being hailed as um, so-called unsung heroes an important recognition that historically they have often carried a large portion of the physical workload in particular, with little recognition and only the material benefit of often meager wages. Yet still, in many contexts, segregated roles continue. Many field staff, including fossil hunters and discoverers, remain solely paid local field help, while the senior professors, often from abroad, and their teams reap the intellectual benefit and prestige. This segregation is starkly illustrated by a 2016 list of honorees and at, a, at an event in Nairobi, Kenya, celebrating unsung heroes in prehistory research, including South Africans. As you can see in the pie chart on the left, the 25 honorees were entirely black Africans, shown in green, all without PhDs. All but two of them were men, highlighting an intersectional component at play as well, with black women rare participants in the discipline at all. In contrast, the list of 20 invited scholars and special, one special honoree at the same event, which is represented by the pie chart on the right, are mostly white, with three exceptions, 
mostly foreign, i.e. non-African, and mostly people with PhDs. Again, this was 2016, effectively yesterday. The segregation of roles by race also exists inside many university spaces in South Africa, where the workforce, cleaners who are overwhelmingly women and lower pay class technicians who are largely men, are mostly black. While academics, particularly at the senior levels, remain largely white and majority male. This is clear simply from Googling the staff profile at places like the Evolutionary Studies Institute at WITS, where the fossil hominin collections, including the town child and more than 3,500 hominin fossils, are now held in the Philip V. Tobias fossil hominin vault, shown here. This continuation of racially segregated spaces from the past illustrates that structural racism persists today in the primary training grounds for paleoanthropology in South Africa, as it persists in myriad spaces all around the world. The racial equality of a so-called rainbow nation has not yet materialized in our discipline. Of course, all of this is reflected in the currency of academia. Authorship, and especially senior authorship, on high profile papers. The demographics of the authorship list of prominent papers emerging out of research on South African materials remain majority foreign and white. From high profile announcements of descriptions of hominin fossil finds to reports of remarkable archeological discoveries in our species like ochre processing workshops and constructed bedding. Where South Africans are authors, they remain majority white, indicating that black South Africans are still today, rare participants in high profile, high impact knowledge production in human evolutionary research. Importantly, although I have focused on South Africa and have pointed out the lack of transformation in our contexts, these dynamics are not just dynamics of post-apartheid South Africa. Because these resources are valuable to the international community, both local and international researchers are complicit in propping up these inequalities. For example, international paleoanthropology field schools, which by design provide training for international students, rely on local help, but train local students in much smaller numbers, if at all and maintain majority white academics and students and majority black field workers in many contexts. Similarly, visiting researchers from abroad doing research on South African materials provide opportunities for their own students in much greater numbers than for local students. And because the primary training grounds for paleoanthropological research overseas, so places like the Institute of Human Origins at Arizona State, for example, are also majority white, the racial dynamics are upheld. Indeed, in the US, a recent, recent survey showed that 87% of biological anthropologists um, generally identify as white. These are the dynamics of a colonial discipline. This transcends institutions and nationalities. The good news is that there have been some inroads to changing this. For example, increasingly international field programs are actively seeking out local students and black senior academics are increasingly taking up posts at universities and museums and other positions of leadership in South Africa and beyond. Much more of our student body is black in South Africa than it used to be when I arrived. And there are inroads into this internationally as well. There are also a few high profile African paleoanthropologists employed at institutions abroad, such as the, the three that are shown here, which includes one South African, Lauren Schroeder. But these still remain relatively small demographic shifts when considering the discipline as a whole, especially given the importance of Africa in the story of human evolution. I've shared these three stories with you to highlight the intersection of race, 
gender, class, education, opportunities, privilege, nationality, and how these have acted to preserve the status quo in human evolution research in South Africa, to shine a light on where we've been and where we are today. What these stories demonstrate is, is first that the discipline has been at the coalface of racist and sexist practices since as long as there has been a discipline. These practices were amplified in the politics of apartheid South Africa, but they are not unique to South Africa. Second, that I myself am part of the group of foreign privileged white people who have benefited from accessing African heritage. I was not exempt from the excitement of and the participation in these neocolonial practices. And as a result, have participated in upholding whiteness and the patriarchy of the academy. Although as a woman, I have also experienced the ugly side of the patriarchy. And third, that professional and personal practices and networks serve to maintain the status quo right up to the present. This is really important and it threads through all of these stories. Um, what it means is that when we develop research teams in science, when we develop our collaborative partnerships, we tend to draw from a pool of people we already know. We work within existing networks and as a result, we assemble our teams out of people of similar backgrounds, with similar educations, who speak similar languages, who have had similar opportunities. In paleoanthropology, because of the dominance of Westerners in the discipline historically, and especially US and European nationals, and because of the systemic racism that animated research in the discipline right from the beginning, fairly homogenous, heavily white Western teams have been maintained right up to the present, as have relatively segregated spaces authorship lists, field schools, etc. White Westerners benefit from the maintenance of the status quo in our discipline because it has worked to give us status and authority. Paleoanthropologists in South Africa, like myself, Lee Berger, Ron Clark, have all benefit, benefited. Your previous Raymond Dart lecture speakers, Bernard Wood, Dean Falk, Rick Potts, they've all benefited. Raymond Dart himself benefited. Now, it's not like any of this should come as a huge surprise. Science does not occur in a vacuum, and clearly the same societal issues that are animating movements against racist, colonial, and patriarchal practices in South Africa and around the world also affect our discipline. We have inequality of representation in paleoanthropology for the same systemic reasons we have it in society more generally. And just as we open our eyes to and work against systemic inequalities in society, we should open our eyes to and work against systemic inequalities in our workplaces. But we are also in the middle of a pandemic and this puts a unique twist on the situation and in my mind provides us with a unique opportunity. This pandemic has essentially ended um, what I call helicopter research in the short to medium term. So severing the research programs of academics who have typically flown into places like South Africa to conduct field work or access fossils then flown back out again. The borders to South Africa have been closed since March and will likely remain closed to at least some international travel outside of regional and safe countries, if you will, for a while longer. Even when the borders do open, quarantines may remain and researchers from abroad will have to consider the risks of travel for themselves and their students. And it's really hard to say, I think in this context, whether um, the same level of travel will ever occur, whether travel will ever be entirely the same. Researchers are now at a crossroads where they will have to decide going forward if they want to wait things out and when all is clear, if all is clear, return to business as usual or whether they want to take the portal moment and shift the way they do science and develop collaborative partnerships. You know, obviously diverse new collaborative relationships would have social benefits by changing the demographics of the discipline, which is the right thing to do politically and morally. 
but I want to talk about how this would benefit the science. Well, firstly, it would benefit the science by creating diverse teams that put equal control of research in the hands of local collaborators. And by doing this, it would allow the research to continue in the face of crises like the one we're currently facing, um, including restricted travel in the face of potential future crises that are comparable to what we're facing now. But beyond this, um, broadening the backgrounds and the mindsets of the teams who contribute to scientific narratives will have the needed effect of getting us closer to the answers we seek. All science is shaped by the people doing it, and it is well known that diversity produces better science. Diversity brings more backgrounds, more experiences, worldviews, angles to considering a problem, which shapes which questions are asked and how evidence is interpreted which simultaneously injects complexity into our narratives and removes the bias that comes from homogeneity of thought, giving us more scientific certainty that our narrative accurately reflects what actually happened. And whether you're a paleoanthropologist or just interested public, as consumers of human evolution research, we do ourselves a disservice by limiting diversity. We don't want a simple story constructed by social norms or limited perspectives. We want the real story, a better understanding of who we are and how we got to be this way. The bias inherent in homogeneity of thought has been noted for a long time where sex and gender are concerned. In archaeology, for example, feminist scholars considering evidence through new eyes have demonstrated that women in the past were tool makers. Um, that they were warriors. These scholars have uncovered and highlighted the work of many marginalized researchers as well. We haven't had this level of feminist inquiry within paleoanthropology, but it is almost certain that we are missing things, lots of things. This is especially true where race is concerned. Let me give a few examples of how scientific narratives have been limited by a lack of diverse perspectives. In recent decades, the dominant narrative of human origins argued that one group in Africa evolved into so-called modern humans. This group was painted as being biologically and behaviorally advanced, physically adaptively superior and behaviorally flexible. As a result, they were uniquely capable of dispersing out of Africa and across the globe and replacing so-called archaic groups that lived elsewhere, such as Neanderthals and Asians, driving them to extinction. These archaic groups were by definition not modern, um, were considered less able than the dispersing group and were typically portrayed as backwards or stagnant. My colleague Sheila Thre and I have recently demonstrated how this model was not only overly simplistic, perhaps because of this homogeneity of thought that I was just talking about, but also carried many imperialist overtones of Western superiority, despite being Africa-centric, including language and iconography of domination, um, conquering control, death and destruction. This Western masculine narrative of dominance and replacement was internalized in the discipline for decades. It implicitly elevated a single group of humans due to their abilities and dominance, their so-called modernness, and it otherized other groups. The research themes of many scholars outside of the mainstream Western space that put forward more nuanced narratives that included cooperation and interbreeding between multiple, multiple groups and um, the messiness of chance effects received little traction and were sometimes actively policed. I include my own work in the body of research that has shown that these messier complex narratives are a better reflection of what happened, but there were many before me. Frustratingly, a lot of these complex narratives have gained traction recently because they are being attributed to the recent work being done by North Americans and Europeans, particularly in the ancient DNA space and often without appropriately acknowledging the scholars who have been proposing them for decades.
Even public perception and general imagery remains affected by this legacy of bias and carries colonialist narratives. This is a male dominated, often violent, um, seen by weapons here, and often racially charged space. White men are often portrayed as more evolved. There is also growing awareness of how much our how much our human origins narrative has been limited by where Western paleoanthropologists and archaeologists choose to conduct their research, and how this is influenced by where the funding comes from, by the researchers doing the work and where they come from, and by the perceived importance of the region, which is itself influenced by societal norms and biases. All of these, which all of which influence the, the narrative outcome. A perfect example of this is how Asia for a very long time was considered a dead end in the story of the origin of our species, sidelined by the old out of Africa narrative I described above. New finds of early modern humans in particular are highlighting the early importance of this region in our species story, but this importance was emphasized by many Asian and Australian scientists for decades and generally dismissed by Western scientists. I still remember attending a public lecture given to a South African audience in 2017 by a PhD candidate from a, a renowned European institution for human origins research. And the researcher answered a question about evidence for the emergence of our species outside of Africa by alluding to the fact that Asian researchers are highly nationalistic and biased and therefore their work should be discredited. Ironically, the Taung discovery itself is an example of some of these issues. Um, Raymond Dart's narrative of human evolution occurring in Africa was met with considerable resistance by most of the prominent Western human origins researchers of the time, people like Grafton Elliott Smith and Arthur Keith, due in part to the racially tinged perception that Africa was not, could not possibly be, the birthplace of humankind. So despite coming from outside Africa, by situating himself here and describing the town child as a human ancestor, Dart became a major contributor in shifting the focus of human evolution research to the global south. Unfortunately, as I've demonstrated, we have not moved much beyond this model of outsiders coming in to study and benefit from African heritage. So to conclude, it has been almost 100 years since Dart came to South Africa. And in that time, the racial demographics and paleoanthropology have shifted very little, despite the end of apartheid two and a half decades ago, and the numerous practices and policies that have been put in place to encourage transformation across academic institutions. And importantly, despite this being a majority black country that has transformed in other sectors to varying degrees. The legacy of past practices continues to affect who controls the science and who shapes the narratives of human evolution. And we are all responsible for changing that in order to create a more robust narrative of our origins. There are lots of ways that we can help. Lecturers can rework their course plans to make sure they incorporate the work of African paleoanthropologists and researchers from related disciplines. Academics from abroad can collaborate with universities that cater to African students and can work to remove financial barriers to field schools and other opportunities for Africans. And international teams can develop long-term, sustainable collaborative relationships with African researchers. I'm really excited that this process has started and that we have the opportunity to accelerate it now in this newly destabilized world that we're living. What will this new robust narrative of human origins look like? Well, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, only time will tell, but it's likely to be complex. You know, we know we're all African if we go back far enough in time, but we're just beginning to flesh out the details, how the history of our species for a very long time has been one of migration, interaction and exchange. We're all intertwined in this history that results in the diversity of people on the planet today. So let's make sure that we get that we all get to participate in discovering it and in telling our story. Let's take the portal moment. 
And I just wanted to leave these resources up here, um, just some resources in case people are interested in reading up on many of these issues and related issues themselves. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Becky. That was bracing and necessary, and I am absolutely sure there'll be a lot of reaction to that. Thank you so much for spending so much time going through that. It clearly speaks directly to our centre with, um, with DART's connection to us. So thank you again. I'm inviting anybody out there who would like to um, type in a question or a comment or a, anything you'd like in the, in the chat function, and I will happily um, give those off uh, uh, till, uh, till Becky because she won't be able to see them. Um, while people are gathering their thoughts, perhaps I might ask one myself. Um, you, you, you talked about when you arrived, and that was for a, a scholarship of, that was intended to be for promoting uh, um, black women in the, in, the, in the instance that you got yours, but there probably wasn't anybody at the time. Has that changed since in the 20 years or so that that's happened? Um, yeah, yeah, it has. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of, so the kind of post that was, it was essentially initially a three-year contract position and they were being used to, um, and we still have these kind, similar kinds of positions. They're being used to um, get people in, often very early career researchers and hopefully grow them and have it be very successful and make them into permanent posts. Um, and so, yes, those do exist. Yes, they have been successful. There aren't a lot of them within paleoanthropology, but there certainly are a um, number more people coming into paleoanthropology and, and archaeology that are Black and Black women in particular than there used to be. But like I said, it's still quite a small number relative to other numbers, um, but it is improving. Uh, for example, we just hired a, a, a black South African female archaeologist in our department. We have a Zimbabwean in our department. We have what would have been called a colored South African in our department. And we have a um, just hired an Ethiopian as well, um, which is also important in terms of diversity. So they, they are working. It is working, um, but it's, it is, has been very slow. To what extent are African students able to go to the north to train and perhaps um, bring their ideas that direction as well as the other way? Is that happening? It is. It's expensive. Um, and I think, you know, you have to, and I'm not against collaborative partnerships. I think they're really important and they're particularly important for African researchers that are located in this, like in South Africa to develop partnerships overseas because sometimes we don't have the same equipment or the same um, expertise that might be in other spaces, um, but you have to have partners overseas who are willing to really um, put the money into to doing that because it's not just flying someone there, it's also putting them up for these sorts of opportunities, often for extended periods of time. And the model in the past uh, has been um, bringing African research, bringing young Africans, for example, to the US, but they have to do their degrees there as opposed to being able to collaborate and develop these sort of longer term uh, partnerships between universities, which I think is, is more important because often people get, you know, sort of educated over there, but the system remains this sort of power dynamic um, that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's some questions and comments coming through, so I might, might go to one of those. Um, Michael Petraglia has one. Um, a most interesting talk, Rebecca, thank you. Can you highlight a couple of key <clears throat> specific practical steps that should be taken to diversify paleoanthropology? Is this just a matter of hiring? I don't think it's just a matter of hiring. I think, you know, you can, you can hire, I mean, hiring is obviously important and we need to get diversity in the room, but I think it's a matter of examining all of your practices. So it's, you know, when you are deciding who your teams are going to be, you know, don't just reach to the networks of people that you've always used, you know, try to look on the ground in the countries where you work and reach out and break into those networks. And I, I don't think we've done a very good job of connecting those networks. Um, generally, try and um, secure money 
to have space within your field schools or research teams to bring students into those spaces as as part of the program. So I, I think it goes well beyond um, I think it goes well beyond just hiring, although it is an important thing. And, and that's what I was trying to really highlight here is the collaborative part. You know, it, I can't tell you the amount of times that we see people come in, oh, I only have a very short amount of time, you know, do the research or do the field work or look at fossils or whatever it is and leave. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not a healthy relationship, you know, that that exists in a lot of these um, contexts. I'll just give you one other example. It's not actually related to um, the field context that I was talking about today, but it's something that literally just kind of popped into my inbox in the last couple of days. So now we're in this space where, you know, it's, it's people can't travel um, or can't travel as much as they might have, but it's often been a situation for people with less money that they can't travel and attend for example, even conferences or workshops overseas. And so this is in my mind right now because um, the APA, the, the association that is kind of the biggest international association for biological or physical anthropologists is now talking about next year's meetings being virtual. And the timing of trying to turn that into an event when you've got, when it's located kind of physically, even though it's not really physically right now, in the United States into something that other people can access, where it's not just an event where, you know, the people in Africa or in Asia who would be sleeping when some of these activities are going on um, get to watch things afterwards, where it's actually a real event where they can participate in the networking and the knowledge production is actually quite complex, right? Because you have to be able to put it at different time periods or, or organize it in a way so that everyone can see the materials, but then you have kind of get together workshops in different time zones. And so it's even just thinking about that kind of stuff, you know, are there things that you're doing in your teams? Are there opportunities, networks, are there workshops you're giving? Are there any sorts of things like that where you can better think about the logistics of increasing participation? from some of these other spaces where, again, Western scientists have um, been benefiting, right, from the materials and resources in those spaces for, you know, a century. So I hope that helps. Yes. I mean, I, I think probably all of us are, are aware of those, those challenges and opportunities. I've been involved in several big international conferences and, you know, there's a really upside is that many people who would never have been able to afford to go can potentially participate. But again, it's the timing thing that becomes a real challenge. Um, yeah, I mean, very... I, I really feel very strongly that we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back, that, you know, people in the state shouldn't be like, now everybody can participate, but, you know, you have to participate between midnight and 3 a.m. kind of thing. I mean, that's not really equal participation. So it's not going to help, you know, and in fact, it could actually make it worse. Yeah. Well, at least for that time zone, because I just wonder how many yes. North Americans listening to you live at this very point, because it's two o'clock in the morning or something horrible. Not many. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's re being recorded, so it will be possible to, when they wake up, I can actually watch. Okay, um, just waiting for some more comments. Um, we, we, I think it now is essential that we have you come over to Australia, if that is ever possible in the future. There's plenty we can show you, plenty of things that we can be disappointed about, and but nonetheless, can be challenged by your talk, um, uh, but you know we we would really love to be able to show you around, for you to meet the people in Arche and get you out into the field. That's what we really hope. So let me hope that that is an invitation that we can take up some some time. That would be uh, wonderful. Okay. Um, here's here's a question from Tanya Smith. That was brilliant. How do you feel about uh, how do you feel? about the movement to remove references to racists, such as the statues and buildings, et cetera, um, which should be we, we abolish or brand, rebrand. In fact, the Dark Lecture, what would be your opinion about that? <laughs> um, you know, Dart's a complicated character. Uh, he's he uh, obviously participated in racist practices. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, but like I said at the end, you know, he also did shine a light on Africa and there were positive elements to that. It's not, hasn't been the best model, um, but I, I do think that these are complicated kinds of spaces. But yes, I, I do, I am very much for the removal of statues of uh, races and symbols of racism. 
um, and for the renaming of things in a, in a thoughtful way. You know, I think the Sarah Bartman Hall was a great example of that. You know, how can we come up with ways to, um, to, to shine a light on some of these stories and histories that were so important and shine a light on the people who were so important in, in those sorts of spaces and kind of go forward being the, the society that we want to be. So I, I'm I'm absolutely for the removal of these things. I'm not, you know I, I I understand the the conversation about erasing history, but it's it all comes down to whose history it is, and and where do you want to go forward with that history? Um, you know, in the future, what you know, who who's do you want to highlight? You know, what are our choices? And I think those are our um, moral and ethical questions, and we're kind of obligated to take them on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a few more coming in now. Um, I'll. Uh, there's a long comment here, but I, I think I'll, I'll be able to, I think it's all right to sort of talk this out. So this is from Ian Davidson, who says, thank you for a fascinating and dare I say it, uh, brave talk. I remember a male white European making a remark at a conference in South Africa in which I had to remind him that it were, might not be a good idea to suggest while in Africa that we are not, that we are all out of Africa after all, in his words. He really did not seem to understand the complaint. My question is about the extent to which Africans have been able to overcome the impression that the interesting things only happened once people got out of Africa. How much is paleoanthropology still concerned about the conditions that got people out of Africa rather than the generation of diversity within Africa? Ooh, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, thanks, Ian. Uh, the, you know, my sense is that paleoanthropologists are starting to um, shift, and this is fairly recent, and archaeologists, I'll, I'll put them in there too, because obviously archaeologists play a, an important role in this sort of narrative. They're starting to shift recently to moving away from that really simplistic out of Africa narrative and, um, and moving to something that's much more nuanced in terms of understanding African diversity. I think I think the skin color research has helped in this respect as well. So you know, trying you know, and, and it's a really good example of this, right? The the idea that so much of the research on skin color variation was kind of based in a a more European model, like everything was black, and then once we got up there, we turned white, kind of thing, as opposed to really um, interrogating the diversity within Africa. So I, I agree. I think it's shifting towards this and understanding this complexity. Um, there's a lot of, um, there's still a lot of stuff to unpack in there. Um, there's still a lot of narratives in an African space that uh, look to other contexts as kind of this more uh, evolved or more civilized space. There's a lot of language around that that's still there. Um, and I'm thinking particularly about a lot of um, important African um, archaeological sites, recent archaeological sites. Um, you know, like Great Zimbabwe and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't know if I'm exactly answering your question, but I, I do think that paleoanthropology needs to needs to kill the idea of out of Africa and needs to kill the idea of modernness and needs to kind of kill the idea of using living people at all. I mean, ethnography is a problem. Living people at all as models for thinking about what we were like in the past. And if we kind of break those couple of things down, and you know, I, I don't even like using the word modern. Then I think it'll move towards a space that's this much more kind of nuanced conversation. But we're we're at the beginning of it, in my opinion. We're not all that far along in this process. Okay. Okay. Another one from Terry Richmond. Richmond, um, should funding agencies or journals have diversity requirements? Yes. Hi, Terry. Um, yeah, you're actually coming from the States, and that's a long way to, to listen to this in the middle of the night. Yeah, I absolutely think so. Um, I used to, for many, many years, I sat on the board of the Journal of Human Evolution um, as an associate editor and also as a book review editor, editor for a handful of years as well. And I have to say that the diversity of that journal, not just in terms of the color of your skin, but also in terms of you know continental diversity, um, uh, global south representation versus global north representation, um, did not shift very much over the fairly long you know decade and a half tenure that I was part of it. And 
And I think that's, um, that's a real problem. And the journal boards, um, editorial boards, you know, how do you, how do you get, and I remember conversations around this, how do you, how do you know who to even ask to be reviewers if you're not in those spaces, you know, you, you don't have those networks, right? The networks are built around these American or European networks. And so those, those people don't get stitched in to the, the networks in the same way. And so then they don't end up becoming associate editors because you've never had them review papers. So you don't know about their abilities in that kind of space. I think that's really important. I feel the same about um, funding agencies, you know, that funding agencies should be and not just lip service uh, to do I have, am I giving something back to the local communities, but actual real like, who, who are your partners? Who have you have you looked to see whether or not you can do um, this particular analysis in the country that you're working in, as opposed to taking the stuff back to where you're going? Because a lot of these capabilities are here, particularly in places like South Africa. I mean, we have great resources. And yet people take stuff out um, or take the CT scan out or whatever it is, or take the teeth out. Um, so I think, I absolutely think so. I think that, that these sorts of, this should be built into everything, kind of the whole way through so that we, we, we split apart these networks and we create a more kind of global um, community and global narrative in a way that doesn't replicate these colonial dynamics because we're still replicating them, right? We, we're keeping them up, you know, it, one, one still has the power. So yeah, that was a long answer, but yes, I agree. <laughs> All right, well, well done. Uh, Sasha says, do you think that new fossil evidence can alter our biased story of human evolution or has it already been written in the face of the intellectual developments and traditions of the West? Um, Yes. I mean, obviously, new fossil evidence is important for all of this, you know, and I, I was alluding to at the end to um, the fact that that researchers are often biased in terms of where they've looked in the past. And, you know, if you've got research teams that are in those spaces and know that there are fossils there or know there are material, materials there, then they're going to relook into new places. But it's even just even just researchers that haven't gone to places at all. Um, and so they're not including uh, regions of the world that they didn't think were important. And so getting fines from those spaces, and this has been shown recently quite a lot in an Asian context, um, getting fossil finds from new places and in India and other spots in South Korea and other other sorts of contexts. Um, Flores hominins, another good example of that, right? Uh, it really does reshape these sorts of narratives in important ways. But I think it has to go, in order to even explore this space, it has to go beyond just fossil finding, right? It has to be, it's, a, it's fossil finding and it's interpretation. And so they kind of both have to go hand in hand in this kind of um, more diverse uh, context, if you will. Okay, excellent. Um, here's, as someone who is new to paleosciences, sciences, I'm wondering why those African skeletons and masks still at wits, why are they still there? What purpose are they serving? Why not identify them, the individuals, and have their families bury the remains? That's a good question. Um, and it's not unlike the conversation around uh, Sarah Bartman, but also some other individuals who's, uh, who had body casting done that were uh, controversial and controversial, that were problematic. Um, they are still there. Uh, they're no longer displayed publicly. I've, uh, I mean, I saw them, they were quite, they were right out there. <laughs> you can see them anywhere. They're now um, housed behind closed doors and are uh, considered to be a historical uh, resource, if you will. Um, I think there, there's, I've seen conversation happening about using them for forensic kinds of contexts. So for facial identification in African populations of remains. Um, I don't think that most of the people would be identifiable as individuals, but I'm sure there are probably some. Um, so I think it's worth a, it's worth a conversation. Yeah. Mm. Okay, look, we don't want to leave, keep those Americans out of bed for much longer, so we'll just have a couple more. Um, do you think, I, I don't know the answer to this one, do you think academics need to be generally become more politically and socially active to help drive this change in addition to reflecting on their own behaviours and practices? I do. I, and I think it's really hard, you know, especially if you're not, if you're not used to doing it. 
Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we can do to become more politically and socially active is to talk to people. You know, you can talk to, for example, young African students in the field or uh, young Asian students in the field, and they're politically active, I promise you, and try to find out what the issues are that really stand out for them and educate ourselves. Um, and educate ourselves in other ways. So I think it's a, it's hard to do, I, I acknowledge that, but I absolutely think it's necessary or these dynamics aren't gonna change. And then those, you know, where you have power, I mean, I'm lucky because I have a certain degree of power now in my, um, academically, you know, you can try to push other people as well and uh, shift them to, again, creating more diverse teams or, or interrogating, I've recently had to do this, interrogating the language of their grant writing and, and other sorts of issues and saying, mm, you know, that's actually problematic what you're, what you're saying and doing, and this is why. So, um, so yeah, we need, to, we need to move forward and, and really look at ourselves closely, yeah. All right, probably just a couple more now. So, um... Martin Poor says, hi Becky, great talk. Do you have specific suggestions or examples how diversity in research teams impacts on methods and analyses in paleoanthropology? Yeah, I mean, I was, I think the example that I was giving was, uh, in fact, I'm gonna give you an example from birds instead of paleoanthropology, because I think this is a really interesting example. And I, want, I, I think it's, a, it's one to, it was just reading about it the other day. And then we can talk more about paleoanthropology. And the example from birds was actually the interpretation of um, song and display behaviors and so certain other aspects of bird as being um, driven by males and driven by male competition for women. And there was an analysis that just came out that showed that there's been a shift in the narrative to kind of show the female bird's um, position within this within the system in terms of how they were driving mate competition in the songs and all of these other kinds of things um, as well. And it, it changed the whole kind of way of thinking about the um, bird biology and bird, um, I don't want to still call them social dynamics, I'm not a bird person, but you know what I'm trying to say, the, the sort of dynamics of, of bird evolution. And the analysis was done to look at the researchers who were driving this narrative and to look at the proportion of female researchers that were driving this narrative and it showed very strongly that the narrative um, this this shift this intellectual shift was driven by women so that's a bird example we have examples in archaeology as i already mentioned of how you have when women are getting involved in these research teams it's causing people to pay more attention to issues and to study new kinds of uh, new kinds of things in different ways. So were women warriors? Could this even be a woman, right? If we're looking at this particular skeleton. Um, there's a conversation, you know, we've had this in primatology. Primatology has shifted much more towards um, a more sort of uh, feminist perspective, if you will, so that diverse narratives have shifted the, the interpretations of primate behavior. Um, in paleoanthropology, we haven't moved this way, so it's hard to kind of imagine what some of these are, but I, I, one that pops into my head is around the interpretation of um, pelvic evolution in humans and having it, it was always previously interpreted as kind of a constraint between pelvic and, and head shape. And now it's being, there's much more of a conversation about um, women's biology and how that might have actually played more of a role in the morphology and the dynamics. Um, and, and women's hormone systems. And that research has been driven by women. So I think it's, and of course it causes you to look at different things, right? You're going to look at different comparative frameworks for understanding the fossil record. So if, if you're now interpreting pelvic change as being something that's related to, for example, hormonal change, as opposed to being something that's a constraint, then you're going to go study other things in these comparative contexts to understand that relationship. So you shift what you're studying, you shift how you're going to, um, the tools you use to study it, but it's all driven by the questions. And it's, it's the questions of who is even kind of coming up with this and why would they be um, centering in the examples I've given you, um, femaleness, right, the, the, the narrative of, of femaleness and why in other spaces they might be centering other narratives, their understanding of landscapes, their understanding of an African context. Um, so there, I think that if I'm, I'm sort of getting at your question, it's, it's less about the methods changing, although they can, and the approaches, the kinds of things you might choose to measure 
might change, the kinds of comparative sampling or context might change, then it is about the questions and how it drives that and how these diverse um, approaches will allow you to have a much a wider diversity of questions, if you will. And we don't have an answer for that pelvic thing yet, but it is starting to shift up, you know, what's been a very long-standing narrative if we start to think about it in, in a, a wider range of ways. Professor Ackerman, I think we'd better draw it to a, a close there. You've, you've been working hard. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, they were timely, bracing and needed to be heard. Let me conclude with a, with a, a comment, just a, a comment from Anthea. Uh, you're a tornado of fresh air. Uh, take that, take that well. Um, and and I invite you, um, Becky, to have a look at all the comments. There's many comments on the side there. So thank you again, uh, and thank we you. look forward to seeing you in Australia in the near future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it, and thank you all for attending. <laughs>